Okay, for George, what's your favorite piece of writing that you've ever produced, even hearkening back to your youth? Yeah, I don't know. That one is like asking a parent, well, which is your favorite child? <laughs> yeah. Mind you, they all have favorite children. They just won't admit it. <laughs> so what's yours? You know, I, 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 some of the, the, my favorite children who live in my head, I haven't actually looked at or reread for, for decades, and probably it would be wise to keep it that way. Uh, obviously, A Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire is going to be what I'm remembered for, if I'm remembered for anything, it's my magnum opus. But it's not finished yet, and therefore, I, I'm, I'm still nervous about, you know, will I stick the landing here? Uh, will, I, will I bring it in as powerfully as I hope to bring it in and make it a complete work of art with a beginning, middle, and end? That's my goal. Mm -hmm. I have done other things that I have finished. I mean, I started out writing short stories, and I, I, a lot of my Short stories, yeah, I produced some stinkers and uh, some that were kind of mediocre, but I also produced some that were very, I'm very proud of. A Song for Laia, my first Hugo winner. Um, Sand Kings, which oddly enough, I didn't think much of when I wrote it, but I love went Sand on Kings. to become <laughs> my, until Game of Thrones, my mm -hmm. most popular work and the one that everybody knew me for, Sand Kings. Mm -hmm. um, a few of the more obscure stories, like uh, This Tower of Ashes or The Stone City, uh, I was really, that was, I think my science fiction is the best it, best it got. Um, some of my earlier standalone novels, uh, Fever Dream, will always have a very special place in my heart. And uh, The Armageddon Rag, uh, you know, I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with that novel because I was very proud of it. I still am proud of it. I think it's an important novel. I'm glad I wrote it. It almost destroyed my career. <laughs> no one bought it, and uh, I couldn't sell any novel after it. So. Uh, it, it changed the course of my life in some huge and fundamental ways, but uh, nonetheless, I, I still have a affection for that. It's interesting that you know TV, ha having been historically regarded as kind of the lower form than film, is actually more useful for exploring a world in great detail. So it's kind of reminding me of the way science fiction and fantasy's fortunes have changed. It seems like. TV is now being seen as something that, you know, you can have really wonderful art and, you know, carry something out for a longer period of time. Well, it's true that historically, uh, you know, feature films were the, the highest level in Hollywood and television was seen as a, as a lower level. So the, the snob factor that we talked about in the literary canon also exists there. But that's completely changed now. Mm -hmm. I mean, feature films have come to be the place to go for spectacle. But if you want serious drama and character development and all that, then it's television. We are living, I mean, forget the early 50s. That was a great age. This is the golden age of television. There have been, never been so many great television shows on. And the, the quality of a, of a television show, of today's television shows, like Game of Thrones, uh, holds up to any feature film. I mean, we've, we've showed uh, Game of Thrones episodes on IMAX screens, you know, blown up to, to the size of a football stadium and, and it still looks great, which you couldn't say for, you know, I mean, don't put any Star Trek the episodes, even the next generation, certainly not the original series on an IMAX screen. It, it, <laughs> it, it's not going to work that way. The but cardboard. The, the special effects, the cinematography, all of the production values of, of the best television shows are, are right up there with any feature film. And uh, more and more directors and writers and actors who previously only did features, are now moving into television. So yeah, it's, it's, exciting a, it's a great new world for people who like television. And there are really more good shows than I can even keep up with. Let's see what we have here. Uh, when writing about a given character, do you attempt to, quote, inhabit them psychologically, physiologically, etc.? If so, how do you get in the frame of mind? Uh, yes, I do inhabit them. Odd as it may seem, I, I am. You know, some of my time I am a, a dwarf, and uh, some of the time I'm an incredibly hot chick riding a dragon. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> some of the time I'm a psychopathic 10-year-old girl, <laughs> killing people and slitting their throats. So uh, it, 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 my, I guess my mood varies, but uh, <laughs> changing between them is very difficult. I mean, I do not write the chapters in the order in which you read them. I, you know, I'm, if I'm in a Tyrian groove, I will write 
you know, three or four Tyrian chapters and uh, then say, well, hold on, I'm almost to the end of the Tyrian stuff for this book. I better stop and write about somebody else. But that transition where I stop writing about Tyrion for a while and then I go write three or four Jon Snow chapters, that's a tough transition because they are very different and they have different voices. They know different people. I have to reread a bunch of the old chapters to remember where they were and what they sounded like. And I usually have a couple false starts when, when changing. But yeah, I live inside my characters, the viewpoint characters anyway.